Bible study, and I want to welcome you to those that are watching online. And uh, if you like what is happening here, it's a lot better if it's live and you're here in person. Amen. Because you may be able to contribute and things. So we're taking a look today at uh, the verse Isaiah 9-6. So everybody, please turn their Bibles to Isaiah 9-6. I thought it said, I don't know where I got that, but I thought it said Jonah. Where? I don't know where it was. I know, I see it now. But yeah, Isaiah so 9, was, 6. And that's the verse that we're going to take a look at and discuss and study and pray over and things. Uh, I title this message, More Than a Christmas Verse. Because this is a verse that people use on Christmas. And they'll preach on Christmas. And uh, we think it's a Christmas verse, but it is... Not just one day. It is a panorama from eternity past to eternity future about Jesus Christ. It's one of the most magnificent, majestic prophecies in the whole Bible. So let me read it. And then uh, those of you that are here on campus here uh, in my office, uh, use your study sheet. And I'm going to do some add-ons on it and things. So Isaiah 9, 6, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. So the outline of this study, uh, this is a great prophetical, theological, and Christological verse. This is a prophecy by Isaiah, and then this is theology right here. Theology is God talk. That's what the word theology means. It's, it's talk about God, and most theology, which becomes doctrine or a creed, is what people have agreed, Christians have agreed, that this is what God's truth means. So it's, it's theological, it's prophetical, but for us, best of all, it's Christological. There's a theological word you've heard me say, and perhaps some of you may not have heard it. It's the word Christology. It is the study of Jesus Christ himself. Christ and ology, like biology, you know, sociology, it's words about and study of. So Christology is the study of Jesus Christ, doctrinally, theologically. The Gospel of John is a very elevated, exalted Christology of who Christ Jesus is. The first two chapters of the book of Colossians is a very strong, elevated Christology because it said Jesus' word created the universe. His word keeps it together and it talks about him in him all the fullness of God is. He is God. And so when you look at Christology, it's usually two things. The life of Christ and the character of Christ. What he did, the life of Christ, his works, usually leading to the cross, and his character, who he is. Those seven I am's in the Gospel of John. The various Christological prophecies in the book of Isaiah. Or many in the book of Psalms. So this verse encapsulates in one little mega capsule, one little mega prophetic pill. I mean, it's like an accordion. It's like the ex expansion from eternity past to eternity future and every good thing in between. So, this early part of this verse covers Christ's humiliation. In other words, what is known as the incarnation, his humiliation. He became a child, mm -hmm. lived nine months in the womb of a young woman, the, the creator, the creator God, the one who spoke into existence everything that you see in a Hubble telescope. That, that very person, that very essence, became a baby and lived in the womb of a, of a woman, a young girl named Mary. And so we see his humiliation. Philippians chapter 2 talks about how Christ emptied himself there. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, it says that he emptied himself 
He did not grasp on to the deity uh, that he had or the glory that he had with God from eternity past. He gave it up, and he self-limited himself. He could only be in one place. He was thirsty. He was hungry. He slept. He was weary and tired. He was totally human. It's his humiliation. But then in this verse also we see the, the exaltation of Christ. So seven uh, outline points of this verse. First of all, we need to understand the eternal pre-incarnate existence of Jesus Christ. That's what John calls in John 1.1 1, 1, the Logos, the eternal Logos. Logos is translated word. And it's interesting that John uses the term Logos because it was a word that was well known in Greek philosophy. Logos meant reason. And Jesus is the reason. Jesus is the reason. Isaiah 118 says, Come, let us reason together, says the Lord, though your sins be as, you know, they'll be as white as, as snow, so to speak, as far as the cleansing. And so we see here that uh, we see the pre incarnate existence of Jesus Christ. And in my sermon series on John 17, as part of my The Words of Christ and High Death, that prayer in John 17. Jesus mentions to God the Father about his pre-existing glory and how he's ready to get that back when he finishes the business he needs to do for you and I. So we see the pre-incarnate existence. Then we see the incarnation. The incarnation is when God became flesh, dwelt among us. The incarnation, it was a literal, physical, actual thing in history. The Incarnation is one of the things that sets the Christian faith to be unique among all the so-called world religions. No other world religion has the Incarnation. So then we see the Crucifixion. The Crucifixion, he dies on the cross. We see the Resurrection. And then a couple of things that we see in specific in Isaiah 9-6 is rank, return, reign, and rule. So with that in mind, let me read it again. For a child will be born to us. That's the incarnation. That's in Bethlehem. That's the humiliation of the eternal, glorious Logos, the second person of the Trinity. He humbled himself, as it says in Philippians 2. He humbled himself uh, for us. He emptied himself. There's a theological theory that the British theologians in the late 1800s developed, guys like P. T. Forsythe and some of the deeper life guys. They call it the kinesis theory, that Christ emptied himself of everything for us. And that's why he was hungry, that's why he thirsted, that's why he was dependent on God in his prayer. He wanted fellowship uh, with God. Um, it's, it's much debated and things, but uh, we see the incarnate for a child will be born to us, for us. It's, it's, it's for us. Then we see a son will be given to us. That's Golgotha. That's the cross. He was given to us on the cross. So look at the geography here already from Isaiah 9-6. Bethlehem and Calvary, Golgotha what is known as Skull Hill. Skull Hill uh, in the scripture. That's what Golgotha literally means, Skull Hill. And there's a couple of reasons that they call it Skull Hill. One is that if you decide that what is called by the tourism uh, thing, Gordon's Calvary, the archaeologist and general of the Brits, uh, Gordon, he claimed that this was Golgotha. It looks like a skull. I saw that. There's an indentation of where the eyes would be and the mouth would be, and it, it's Golgotha, uh, the skull. But there's another interesting thing. I don't know whether it's true or not. Maybe I shouldn't even bring it up. But among the Hebrew rabbis, they believed that the skull of Adam was buried on that hill. And that's another reason why it was Skull Hill, that somehow Abraham got a hold of it, it was passed on, and they buried it there and whatnot. Um, 
Skull Hill. Now, interestingly enough, there's a church up in Seattle area called Skull Hill. That's the name of the church, mm -hmm. Skull Hill. Calvary. It's, it's equivalent to Calvary Baptist Church, would you say? Calvary Methodist Church or Calvary uh, reaching younger people and younger folks with a different vocabulary than mine um, and things. Uh, they call it Skull Hill. How come they're in Seattle? Shouldn't they be down in Oakland with the Raiders? <laughs> whatever. <laughs> what, what, whatever. Um, there's another church uh, called Scum of the Earth Church. Because Paul described us as scum of the earth. Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews says that we are not worthy of this world, those that by faith and uh, things. So uh, we see here the humiliation and the exaltation. We see Bethlehem born to us. We see Calvary, a son given to us. See, first, he's a child. He's a child. But in reality, he's the Son of God and God the Son. There is no such thing as what is called in modern theology and in some cults, adoptionism. It's a term called adoptionism. That Jesus was a good guy and, uh, you know, born of a good family. And uh, he was kosher in genealogy. And then at his baptism, God adopted him as his son. And that's what cults that don't see the true truth of who Jesus Christ is. They have a bogus Christology. Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, other groups that say Christ was created. That uh, one says he's the devil's half-brother and all this. No, he is, he is the son who was given on the cross. Then we see resurrection, rank, return, and, and reign. So let's go through this. Uh, after a child is born, a son given, the government will rest on his shoulders. The government will rest on his shoulders. A general, whether it's a three-star, four-star, five-star general, uh, Jesse would know about it. He was in the military. Vic would know about it. He was in the military. Where does the five-star general, when Ike was the commander and had five stars, where did he have the five stars? He had them on the shoulders. And what is represented on the shoulders represents authority, ability, his strength, uh, the carry on the, the shoulders. And so it, it talks about his rank, his rank. The government shall rest on his shoulders. I like the term, the government. Because don't we all have a little bit of dissatisfaction with things about the government? Huh? Huh? <laughs> you may be watching on, online. Uh, we're not a big political church. I don't preach politics from the pulpit. I preach God's word and God's truth. If you want to know my politics, meet me out in the parking lot, and I'll tell you more than you want to know. But notice the government will rest on his shoulders. That's the eschatological rule of Jesus Christ. Most call it the thousand-year reign, the millennium, but it's farther than that. And here's the bottom line. Every government fails. Every government will fail. Every government will, will fail. They have down through history to show that the one perfect government that the book of Revelation touts is the rule of Jesus Christ. We have the benefit and blessing and privilege of letting Christ rule us right now without waiting for the Armageddon battle and the results and the afterflow from that and the millennium and eternity and, and heaven. Christ can reign and rule in us right mm -hmm. now. Amen. We believe Christ is resident in us. He's come into our hearts. I always say, let the resident Christ become the president Christ, mm -hmm. the, the one that presides over our life. In other words, calls the shots calls the shots. I, I remember one big mega church pastor, he didn't he didn't want to use theological terms because he said that these people don't understand them and all that. And uh, and so instead of calling and in the sermons calling Jesus Lord, he said, Jesus, let Jesus be your CEO. <laughs> and I said, okay, cool, but it's not the full truth. There's a meaning of Lord, kurios. Lord, 
uh, a CEO only controls you during business hours and on the job and on the marketplace yeah. and things. Jesus as Lord controls every area, Amen. everything in your your life. And a CEO uh, still has to answer to a board. It certainly does. Uh, how many CEOs get fired? The great story is, of course, Steve Jobs, the, the company that he founded. He got dismissed by, by the board of directors. Mm -hmm. Of course, he took it over again and things. But the government will rest on his shoulders, the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. So we see the shoulder. We see his rank. Then uh, it says that he will be called Wonderful Counselor. There is more to this than we can ever imagine. First of all, the term wonderful. Wonderful Counselor. And by the way, there are four couplets. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, and Prince of Peace that are in this. And these have representations of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I'm not going to go into it because we'll be sitting here forever. And we don't want to do that. We want to spend time in prayer. But Wonderful Counselor, as a Wonderful Counselor, he's able to make wise plans corrections and connections, but the term wonderful literally in the Hebrew means supernatural. Hmm. He is the supernatural counselor. And uh, we see in that, it's the Hebrew word relen, relen, it's supernatural. Uh, it is beyond, it is beyond human wisdom. It's, it's beyond human wisdom and there's a place and a value for Christian counseling. I, in my pastoral ministry, I wouldn't take on uh, counseling couples with problematic marriages for two reasons. Number one, if they've had lifetime or years long of situations and this and that, I can't solve it with a push button thing in one hour. And second, which is wisdom, I don't want to know about a lot of personal stuff that I shouldn't know. I don't want to know the bedroom stuff. Oh, and yeah. they'll tell you. I, I don't yeah. want to know it. And here's the reason why I refer to Christian Counseling Centers or to Christian Counseling Group, uh, good counselors for that, is because, just to be honest with you, most pastors aren't equipped to do it. Mm -hmm. And second, here's the deal as a pastor and as a shepherd and, and loving people. If I'm counseling a couple eight, nine, ten times, and even in the original, I only counseled if the husband and wife together. I wouldn't do one alone. You know, but, you know, if they told me something and, you know, and then they reconcile, everything's honky-dory, everything's wonderful. And then uh, in my sermon that comes up next in the scripture series I'm preaching, I oh, preach on something. Awkward. They'll say, he's talking about us. <laughs> he knows about us. He knows. Exactly. You know, and uh, it's just healthier to avoid all that. So he is the supernatural, it, it literally means the supernatural, miraculous counselor. And he makes miraculous, wise plans and, and corrections on us. He is wonderful counselor. Uh, any comment or question on, on that idea of wonderful, supernatural, miraculous counselor? Amazing. All right, let's go on to our Grace. next mighty it's amazing. God. It is. He's the mighty God because he is the mighty God. His counseling, uh, he, he, he has the power to do what needs to be done. He is the, the mighty, mighty God. We see his strength. We see the divine power. He has power. The book of Job in the end talks about power. You know, the three friends of Job uh, counseling him. Job at the end said, you know, you guys are bogus doctors. You guys, have, you know, and they they symbolize three kinds of people: the traditionalist, the loosey goosey, whatever, and then the third uh, uh, counselor was the self righteous. And then a younger guy named Elihu came in and uh, talked a little bit more about God. And then in that dialogue, guess who takes over in the thirty eighth chapter? God takes over, and he asks about 20 questions. You know, you guys, I think you know it all. Were you there? Did you create a horse and give the horse its strength? 
And that's where you get the term 20 questions, by the way. You know, what is this? 20 questions? God asked 20 specific questions uh, of there. But so uh, he, he is the, the mighty God, the mighty, mighty God. And the term might is where we get the term El Shaddai. That's one of my favorite songs. I loved it when Sandy Patty mm -hmm. sang the song. Uh, you know, if you're a certain generation, if you're the digital, you might not even know who she is. But if you get your exercise running around evangelical circles, I love that song that Sammy Patty sang, El Shaddai, El Shaddai, and, um, and things. So that word El Shaddai is translated into our English, Almighty. Almighty God, Almighty, Almighty. It's amazing how the prophets use that name for God, Almighty, because the names of God represent a character aspect of Him, of God of him and uh, what he does for us uh, the word Shaddai El Shaddai means stronger than a mountain okay you can kick over a mushroom can you kick over Mount Everest or Mount Aconcagua in South America can you kick over Mount McKinley or even Mount Whitney close to us uh, no you can't and God is stronger than that because the prophet Isaiah and some of the uh, lesser Prophets said, should I open the door here? I have the air on. Need some air blowing get some in. Fresh air. I know I'm full of hot air, and so we just come <laughs> on, just gonna get over there. I didn't say that. No, I, I said not in, I had the not in so many it. words. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so he's all almighty, almighty God. You can't you can't kick over a mountain. Almighty. And notice it says that uh, his name shall be called wonderful. A name represents your character. Mm -hmm. A name represents your character. If I were to throw out names instantly, uh, you think of character, character areas. Uh, yeah, good idea. Let me get this one going. Oh, that's we smart. got them. Why don't we use them? That's well, smart. because when I was teaching there. in here, we thought they didn't work. Yeah, they do. Because, All right. Because well, the things were up. So we're we in good shape were... now. Okay. So hey, anybody got a jacket? <laughs> yeah. His his. Uh, so he he is the, the oh. mighty the mighty God. He can solve our situation. He can solve our situation. All power goes through through him, and he shares that with us. Philippians four thirteen says, "I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me." And that I can do all things is not so much stuff on a to-do list. Literally in the Greek it means I can endure. I can endure. Hmm. I can endure all things. I, I can endure some criticism. I can endure an illness. I can endure some turmoil. I can endure a negative thing in the workplace or the marketplace. I can endure all things. And two verses up. Paul writes, I've learned to be content in no matter what state I'm in. You know, even, even if I'm in the state of Nevada or the state of California or the state of confusion, I've learned. And when Paul says, I've learned to be content, do you, do you not think that when he said, I learned, that's a lesson he learned in his life? It didn't come instantly and automatically. He, he learned it. Mm -hmm. By the way, as Christians, we're always in the learning process. We never reach the point where we know it all. And I say what counts in life is what you learn after you know it all. Huh. I just read that somewhere. Did you? That very same statement. Uh -huh. Yeah. The other area, and uh, I hate to throw in the Marine Corps once again, but a good Marine knows what he doesn't know. Hoorah. And then he finds out <laughs> where to, you know, a lot of young pastors. Anchors away. You know, when I was my first pastor, I, I, I didn't know what I didn't know. I knew nothing about, you know, getting along with people and this and that and I didn't realize in my first pastor that they were letting me be their pastor huh. now that I've got some time in and some saltiness and experience and a little bit of a track record and, and everything uh, you know you, you have a little bit more authority and ability but you still work with people so you either work around people work with people or work through with people but this is a very high intensive people thing Can be. And the other thing that people don't understand about church life is you work with volunteers. Now, we talked earlier about CEO. 
Okay? Uh, in all other entities, there are threats if you don't perform. For instance, in the corporate, corporate world, if you don't perform, you get terminated. Or you get, you get your desk taken away, or your office on the corner window taken away, and you get a cubicle, and then you're told with your computer to take your work home, and then you get a letter, uh, you've been terminated, and here's your separation pay. Uh, so the CEO has leverage because he can fire the person and take away their benefits. The football, baseball, basketball, athletic coach has leverage. Because if the player doesn't show up for practice, what can he do? Can't kick him off the team, but can bench him. You're not playing. You weren't at practice. You're not playing. You know, there, there's control. In the military, it's the classic. If you don't obey orders, what happens? You get put in the brig, or you have what is called commander's mass, or you know non-judicial punishment, or whatnot. In time of war, if you run. Or you disobey an order, uh, what happens? You, 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 I know it, it happened one time with one guy, Private Eddie Slovic, in World War II, was executed by our American soldiers in a firing squad. You get killed. You, you get shot. Now, in a church, does the pastor kill somebody if they miss prayer meeting? Or somebody and Anaya sends a fire. <laughs> <laughs> or, or somebody that has responsibility and they're shirking their duty? You know, what do you do? You, you work with people, work around people, or work through. The pastor doesn't have any leverage in those areas. That's why I leave it to the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. That's why I leave it to God. You know, you know the Lord will, will, work it, will work it through. So sure. we see the mighty God. Last two real quick, Eternal Father. Eternal Father. Eternal Father. And uh, what it says really in, in the Hebrew is uh, Father of Eternity. Father of Eternity. And fathers create things through their seed, children. And uh, we see here that he is the Father of Eternity, and Christ relates to the essence of the God of Eternity, but the energy is different. Same essence. That's the thing about the Trinity. You have three in one, one in three. Three separate persons. All three are God. But God the Father is not God the Son or God the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not God the Father, God the Son. And God the Son is not God the Father, God the Holy Spirit. But they're of same eternal essence and power. I, I don't want to use the term functionality because people that deny the full trinity and people that deny the Holy Spirit as being part of the Trinity. And there's a lot of visible groups that are, are like that. Uh, a big heresy in that is called modalism. That when God is the Son, there's no God the Father and God the Son. When He's the, acting as the Holy Spirit, there's no God the Son. It's, it's, it's called monarchical modalism, that He's in separate modes. No, He's the same yesterday, today, forever. I am God, I change not. The essence is all the same, but the energies, like Jesus going to the cross, and th these things have their aspect. So we see the eternal Father, and then closing with the Prince of Peace, the, the, the Prince of Peace. And in Hebrew, it's the Prince of Shalom. Mm -hmm. Shalom is a big, big Hebrew term. We all know the term aloha. You ever go to Hawaii mm -hmm. and get the Hawaiian air thing and you get off the airplane and they give you a bag of macadamia nuts and put a layer on you and then you say aloha which means hello and goodbye so if you're meeting and greeting people it means hello if you're leaving aloha means goodbye well shalom has the same connotation for hello and goodbye but it also has four other connotations the word shalom it literally means the peace of God the wellness of God having spiritual health with God and knowing Him personally. And we can pray for others to have God's shalom. Often when I pray for our church members, I will pray, Lord, put your shalom upon so-and-so's life. Let them know their shalom. Jesus Christ 
is the Prince of Peace. These four couplets, wonderful counselor, supernatural, miraculous counselor, the mighty God, powerful. The Greek for El Shaddai or Almighty is Pantokrator, all powerful, all strong. And in every Eastern Orthodox Church, on the ceiling of their copula, their little dome, sometimes it's onion shaped, inside on the very top is a picture of Christ going like this. And it'll say, Christus Pantocrater. Panto means all. Crater means strength. All powerful, almighty. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. All right, I've done all the talking. Any contribution, question, insight you want to add on before we pray? Can, can you see how this one verse is in a capsule? The, the entire shebang. I mean, theological, Christological, prophetical, uh, the whole thing, the whole, I mean, from eternity past, eternity future. I'd kind of like to know, because you, maybe you could say it in one sentence, you said it was too long, but how about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John with this verse? Well, Matthew presents Christ as king, yeah. so we see the government will be on his shoulder. It's the basic... Um, what each of the book emphasizes, Matthew emphasizes Christ as king. Okay. So it's what the books... Yes, uh, the what first the books four books. Do. I can go okay. into this forever because in the Holy of Holies, there on um, the mercy seat, the two angelic figures, their faces have the face of a lion, which represents a king, an ox, which represents a servant, a man, which represents man, and an eagle, which represents God, or the fourth gospel, John. Yeah. Even on the very faces, on on the mercy seat and the Ark of the Covenant is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I can go into this in all parts of Scripture. So Matthew presents Jesus as, as the king. So why does the genealogy of Jesus go back to Abraham and David? Because as king of the Jews, Abraham was the first Jew, first Hebrew, and David was the legitimate line of Judah line of Judah that was King David Saul was of the line of Benjamin he was not of God's chosen royal line and that's why uh, in Matthew the parables are called kingdom parables the kingdom of God is like the kingdom of God Mark presents Christ as perfect servant in fact the whole purpose of that book is said in Mark 10 45 that I am come I am come to serve man and to die for them. And uh, so he's the servant. He serves. And as Matthew was written to the Hebrew mindset, and Mark was written to the Roman mindset. The Romans were in a power, in the government. Here, the government on his shoulder. They were in a power, and they had half the population of the Roman Empire were slaves. Anybody that was an employee was considered a slave. And so there's no genealogy. There's no genealogy in the book of of Mark, who cares what your background is when you're a servant, when you're a domestic? Who cares about your past? Get the job done now that, that needs to be done. Luke presents him as a perfect man, written to the Greek mind by a Greek, Dr. Luke, had a great bedside manner and the greatest prescription of all, Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So Luke has a genealogy that goes all the way back to not Abraham and not David, it goes all the way back to Adam. Because Christ became man, flesh, and dwelt among us. The parables in Mark are power parables. Power parables like the Romans. You know, they wanted power. It's in the Gospel of Mark. You see Christ's power and authority over the demonic and over the unseen evil underworld. In Luke, the parables are human. Human relationship parables. That's why you have the parable of the prodigal son and the waiting father. That's why you have the parable of the Good Samaritan, which is an oxymoron, because the audience Jesus told that to believe that there's no such thing as a Good Samaritan. In their mind, all Samaritans were bad. It's an oxymoron. Two words put together that are opposite. It's like jumbo shrimp. <laughs> Military intelligence. <laughs> how, about, how about genuine imitation leather? <laughs> Genuine imitation oxymoron. Yeah. My favorite oxymoron of all time is Microsoft Works. 
<laughs> I'm sorry. Have you ever That's wrestled funny. with computers? Microsoft my works. Perhaps some of you watching online, you're struggling with your computer being online. Well, the, the parables of, of Luke, the parable of the rich man that went to hell, all of a sudden he becomes the greatest evangelist in the Bible. He has burden concern for his five brothers so they don't, they don't go to that place. And he asks Brother Abraham or Father Abraham, there's a wall of separation and says, Abraham, send me back so I could tell my brothers and surely they'll believe. And the word was that even if one come back from the dead, they will not believe. And they didn't believe Christ. Yeah, they didn't believe Christ when he rose from the dead. Well, let me finish up because we need time for prayer. John presents Jesus as perfect God. By the way, Luke writing to the Greek mind, Greeks were in a perfection. They were in a perfect, you know, perfect body. Venus de Milo, when she still had her hands and arms, you know, Adonis and perfect <laughs> literature and philosophy. And anybody that wasn't a Greek was called a barbarian. And the Greeks thought that their language was perfect. In fact, anybody that did not speak Greek was called a barbarian. And we get the term barbarian from the word barbar. -bar. Like they couldn't speak decent. They, the way they speak is barbar, barbar, bar -bar gibberish. That's where the term barbarian uh, comes from. Better than infidel. Infidel, <laughs> yeah. Barbarians. Or deplorable. Uh, deplorables, a basket full of them. Yes, indeed. So... Uh, Jesus is the perfect man for the Greeks. John is a completely total other gospel. The way it begins, and it's just totally different. And it was written to all people, presenting Christ as perfect, perfect God. And the gospels relate to these right here. So it was more than a long sentence. More than it, a sentence. It was a, it, it was, I understood. It was a PhD dissertation, but I Thank did you. it brief and shortcut. <laughs> So let's leave it at that. Let's go ahead and pray. One last thing on the Prince of Peace. Uh, is there going to be peace in the Middle East in our lifetime? Is there going to be a solution? Or are they going to keep on fighting? I mean, they've been fighting for, what, 4,000 years, 3,000 years? Yeah, why stop now? Huh? Why stop why now? Why stop now? <laughs> That'll preach. Pastor, I was, I was at my daughter's, you know, this past yeah. weekend, and Raquel and I went to a restaurant, and while we were standing, had to stand in line, there was a Marine that came in. Hoorah. And I, oh, oh, I'm sorry. I thought he was a Marine, but he had Navy on him. A wannabe <laughs> Marine. That's okay. Oh, no, Jeff did wannabe Marine. Speak uh, for yourself, sir. <laughs> uh, anyway, I said to him, thank you for serving our country. <clears throat> and he said, it's my pleasure. And I said, I don't know how we got to talking mm -hmm. with someone. I said, anyway, I said, um, it's it's just awful, isn't it? And he said, it's going to get better. And I said, when Jesus comes, Amen. and he looked, he went like this. <laughs> I, I don't think he was a believer. <laughs> <Yeah. Well, laughs> was his reaction, but that's okay. It, we won't have peace till Jesus comes. So Amen. it's okay for me to say that. Good for you, and God bless you for for bringing up bringing up uh, the, Jesus in that. He heard it from you first. Yeah. <laughs> so here's what I'm saying: the war, all the crazy stuff in the Middle East, the two major world religions in the Middle East, Judaism and Islam, both reject who the Prince of Peace really is, and until they accept him as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, they're not going to have that peace. They're not, they're not going to have that peace. So, With that in mind, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. We want to open up with praise and thanksgiving for who Christ is.